This time on the Tentative Apologist podcast, we sit down for a conversation with theologian Michael Hardin. Michael is a scholar who has studied the works of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and René Girard, and who also counts Girard as a personal friend. He is also a visionary and activist, and together with his wife Lori, he founded the ministry Preaching Peace. Their website is preachingpeace.org. It's a ministry which seeks to propagate the transformative power of the gospel of nonviolence. Michael has spoken around the world as part of this ministry, and he was also interviewed for the documentary Hellbound, which came out in 2012. Michael is also the author of several works, including his important 2010 book, The Jesus Driven Life, which Greg Boyd lauds as a clear and compelling vision, and Walter Wink praises it as a brilliant study and a magisterial synthesis. As I discovered in our wide ranging conversation, Michael is provocative, iconoclastic, penetrating, disturbing, and always thought provoking. Whether you agree with him or not, I think everyone who engages him will find a challenging voice for peace in a world so often beset with violence and retribution. Michael, thank you for joining us here at the Tenet of Apologist podcast. I want to begin with a song. It's a song that a lot of people like, and I'll just give you a lyric and just get your response. And on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. My comforter, my all in all, here in the power of Christ I live. It's a song that was very moving to many people, a worship song, and there's theology in it. And I'd just like to hear your response to the theology, if you could unpack it a bit and give your response. Well, I would say, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, notice the word power in the last verse. Very important. Um, that old hymn, There's Power in the Blood. What the, the church is confessing is something incredible happened. There's this um, dunamis moment in the cross. There's something powerful occurring. And the only language they have for what's occurred is this economy of exchange language. Jesus exchanged something for us. There was an exchange that went on between the Father and the Son. And we've known this for 500 years since Calvin, even though it was not at the heart of Calvin's system, and even though it wasn't at the heart of Beza's system, who put predestination at the head of the Calvinistic paradigm. Certainly, by the time you get to the 17th century, it has become a feature of Reformed theology, uh, some Lutheran theology, pietist thinking, and um, has been with us ever since. So I understand why they're thinking that direction. That's, that's fine. The problem is that's not the biblical God. The God of Scripture is not a God of exchange. The God of Scripture freely gives, freely shares, is forgiving in God's own heart, is loving in God's own heart. Sin doesn't change God. It changes us. And part of the liberation process then is that there is this power in the cross. However, it is not a penal satisfaction economy of exchange power. It's the power of the demonstration of what real love and forgiveness can do to transform human lives and bring peace out of social conflict. I, I've heard uh, somebody give a, a penal substitution take on the prodigal son where he says, okay, the son comes back and he apologizes and the father says, fine, but first you must atone for your sins. sins yes, I've seen that same. I uh, wish I could remember who did it. It was very clever. I think well, Robin Collins, I think. Was, Robin Collins, that's yeah. it. That, yeah, he's yeah. a friend of ours in uh, Pennsylvania there, lives up the road. But aren't there, I mean, isn't the whole framework of atonement one of transaction that there has to be blood? Without blood, there is no forgiveness for the remission of sins. There's, you've asked two different questions. Um, the first question, doesn't there have to be blood? And the second question, what does the scripture say? And you quoted the Hebrews 9.22 text. Mm -hmm. So I want to say, first of all, um, there will be blood. There must be blood. But it is, does not have to be according to the interpretation you've just given, using Hebrews 9.22 as the scriptural warrant. Because what's interesting is 9.22 says, I just did this this morning at the mm. Mennonite Church, this very mm. text, I exegeted it. It says, according to the law, nothing can be forgiven without the shedding of blood. This very phrase occurs again in verse 8 of chapter 10, where the writer is using an anti-sacrificial critique 
using Psalm 40 on the lips of the pre-incarnate Christ to say that in fact that's the problem with the law, is that according to the law everything has to have bloodshed. In other words, there according to the law there has to be an economy of exchange. 922 is not saying that God says there must be. The writer to the Hebrews is using this language to point out that there doesn't need to be on God's part, but there does on our part. We as humans are a sacrificial species. If there's anything we know from ancient mythology to um, uh, archaeological diggings regarding human bones, the recent discoveries at Gobekli Tepe and other, and other places, if there's one thing we know about humans, it's that we're a sacrificial species. And I have been using the work of Rene Girard now for a quarter century, and I'm fairly convinced that this way of seeing the human species as a sacrificial species means that in order for God to come into this matrix we've created of religion that's sacrificial in, in nature, God can come from one of two positions, that of the persecuting community or that of the persecuted victim. So God comes and reveals God's very self in the life of the persecuted victim, Jesus of Nazareth. And as Markheim says, in the cross, Jesus is not getting into God's justice machine. God in Christ is getting in ours. But isn't the whole temple system, uh, see, like the, the, the way that people will often understand atonement is the atonement is the culmination of the temple system of blood sacrifice. And it seems almost like you're saying, in fact, it's the negation of it. it exact, that's exactly what I'm saying. It is the negation of it. You have an anti-sacrificial program in the prophets and many of the psalmists uh, prior to the exile, during and after the exile. I mean, there's a, a massive temple critique going on in Judaism, and it doesn't stop there. It continues on into the uh, post-Maccabean revolution, or even before that with the uh, splitting off of the Qumran community, if that's around that time. I mean, there, there is not a satisfaction with this temple thing. There, you know, there's questions about who has the true temple, the Samaritans or or the, or the um, Jerusalem um, elite. And of course, there's the destruction of the Samaritan temple in 157 under John Hyrcanus. Then there's the other question about the temple at Leontopolis, you know, which mirrors the temple in Jerusalem where its sacrifice is valid. Well, as long as it keeps sending its temple tax, they are according, you know, I mean, you, there's, the temple is not this thing that somehow originated in God's mind that people then managed to do. Right. The whole thing was um, a mess from the get-go. My sense is this. The anti-temple critique in Scripture, the anti-sacrificial critique in Scripture, goes hand-in-hand hand with the anti-marginalization critique of the prophets. In other words, we're all using victims. The problem with the temple hierarchy is that's where the money flows, and so they're the wealthy, and they're the ones that are involved in the social program of the 1% keeping the 99% down. And that's the, where it comes in, is when you use religion to justify social violence, that religion has become useless. And I think that Jesus saw that, shuts the temple down in a prophetic act. So it doesn't, I mean, it's not, it doesn't really work, but that's it. But doesn't act. he do that through violence? No. There's Overturning no the tables? No, there's no, there's, where's violence in the text? He overturns the money tables, changers tables, but is there any violence against a human being? No. Well, maybe one of the tables hit their ankle when it oh, fell. Oh, <laughs> gee whiz. Maybe they got a boo-boo from Jesus. No, Jesus is not angry. The word orge is never used in any of the four accounts. Um, it's not about anger. It's a prophetic act in the lineage of Isaiah and Jeremiah. I mean, had it been really substantive, the guard would have, the, would have come down from the fortress Antonia. It wasn't that big a deal. It was a small thing, you know, and obviously didn't attract enough attention to get him arrested, which it should have if it was major. Although maybe in the synoptics placement, it seems it is the, the, the first in a series of steps that lead to his crucifixion. I'm not convinced that it happens there. I can understand why the Mark and narrative puts it there in Mark 11 and Matthew and Luke simply follow along. I think the Johannine author, you can almost make mm -hmm. a case for the historicity of it coming in as the opening act rather than the denouement. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's uh, certainly that's different to hear John Trump in the synoptics on a historical <laughs> issue. But hey, I will. J. T. Uh, Robinson, C. H. Dodd, Ray Brown, I'm with them. You're good company. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's go back to another to a lyric in the in that song. So it refers to the wrath of God being satisfied. And sorry, there certainly is a lot of 
wrath of God in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So how do you understand the wrath of God as it is depicted in Scripture? From a Girardian perspective, using mimetic theory as an anthropological reading of Scripture, now let, let's just pause yeah, for a we second. Gotta, we gotta, I'm gonna pause. I, I think, that. in fact, there are there are a couple things we should probably do. We should you should just say a few words about penal substitution, which All you've right. been talking about, and then go on to Gerard mimetic theory and, and right. your response. Okay, penal substitution essentially comes from Calvin. Calvin is the first theologian to tie jurisprudence to Anselm's um, substitution theory. Anselm in 1098 and Cur Deus Homo simply was seeking to say that the universe gets out of balance because God is dishonored and that Jesus is this perfect sacrifice because he's infinite, not finite, and therefore can balance the scales of justice. There's no wrath of God in Anselm. It's just a substitutionary procedure. That's all Anselm was seeking to do. It's Calvin in his um, uh, arguments against the Anabaptists who will most vehemently begin to say that God had a dark side that had to be appeased. And Calvin is trained as a humanist lawyer before he goes on to become a, a theologian and pastor. He ends up bringing Genevan jurisprudence into this model of atonement, saying that God was not only dishonored, God was angry. God had an active feeling that had to be dealt with before God could accept us. So God, by God pouring Jesus' wrath on the cross, out wrath on, I'm sorry, by God pouring his own wrath out on the cross on Jesus, what you end up having is this, if you believe that, then that wrath won't come on you. And this is why they end up having to teach limited atonement, because if God pours out his wrath on Jesus, then it's all done. Well, no, there's still some left over at the end for those that don't believe. So, yeah, they're kind of stuck with the logic of this thing. That's the first piece. That's penal substitution as I understand it. But it's not the gospel. It never has been. In the cross, I want to ask, how do the authors of the New Testament perceive this business of Jesus' death. It's obviously foundational uh, before all four Gospels. That's uh, the most explicit narrative. If Geert Tyson is correct, um, it's the first narrative to be put together in the early church around the year 41, uh, beginning with the garden scene and moving on to the, to the burial. Paul says, I preach Christ crucified. It is the entire theme of the epistle to the Hebrews. Um, the Johannine author, the author of the fourth gospel, um, his whole theory is that God's glory is revealed in God's greatest humiliation on the cross. The hour is the hour of the cross. Now you have Everything is pointing to the cross in that book. So I would say you have all these major writers in the New Testament all focused on what is going on here, and none of them, none of them, none of them use economy of exchange languages, though something was was given on the cross that we might then ask God for on our behalf, with one exception, and that's 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now in that text, 2 Corinthians 5.21, you have, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when it comes to 2 Corinthians 5.21, here's the problem. One, the word God is not in the text. The subject of the verb poio is implied in the verb. So scholars will go, well, gee, you know, the, we've been speaking about God reconciling the world to himself, therefore God must be the subject of the verb. Not necessarily so. One, again, uh, critical scholars will point out that 521 is a piece of tradition. Paul's picking up a piece of tradition to say, I'm not saying anything different than you're saying to his opponents that are there at Corinth. Second, the question is, if God is not the subject, if just a verse or two earlier it had been saying God reconciled the world to God's self by not counting their sins against them, if that's the case, then you have to import a sacrificial interpretation into 521 and you have to make God the subject of the verb. But if you don't, if humanity is the subject of the verb, then what we have here is an exchange that is so Pauline in character, it's extraordinary. Here's how I translate this. <clears throat> The one who was innocent was deemed guilty by humanity. Therefore, inasmuch as we made a wrong judgment about the innocent Jesus, God is right to make a wrong judgment about us and declare us who are guilty to be in right relationship with God. That's the exchange I see going on there in 521. And I think that's how Paul sees the gospel.
So then tie in the, the Girardi and mimetic theory. Well, the, the most important piece of this is going to be related to how God forgives sins in 519. It says, God was reconciling the world to God's self, not counting their sins against them. And one of the things Girard points out in the Lucan story of the cross, and admittedly in chapter 23, 32, I believe it is, we're dealing with a textual variant. Um, the um, crucified Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And Girard says, this is the first literary allusion to the non-conscious. That is what Jesus does on the cross, is he separates intention from action. Now, this is a huge step, because we need intention and action to go together in order to prosecute a crime. And when we are able, when a lawyer is able to remove intention, then the person is not, you know, goes to prison and gets rehabilitated. They end up in a mental institution. Jesus disconnects intention and action and sin on the cross for everything. Now, this is a remarkable thing. What it means is God is free to not have to charge us, to not have to say, you did this on purpose, but you don't know what you're doing. And what's interesting also here, if you think in terms of penal sat satisfaction theory of Calvin, in that theory, God puts our sins on Jesus on the cross. But the New Testament never once says God puts our sin on Jesus. In fact, what it does say is God put the law, the accusatory instrument, on the cross in Colossians 2, 13 to 15. It's the accusatory instrument that ends up on the cross, not our sins. So, well, what about all the places where God gets so angry? I mean, throughout the Old Testament, we could multiply examples of, of God's rage that is raised against the Israelites and other nations. Yes, again, from a, uh, looking at this um, without a theory of inspiration, which is one of my projects, is how do you develop a theory of the authority of Scripture without a theory of inspiration? So this is what I've been doing. What I've come up with in, in my work is a threefold model uh, of looking at Scripture. Scripture has two perspectives and three voices. So using Girard's categories, a myth is a story that's told from the perspective of the persecuting community where either the victim in the myth agrees with the community's assessment and why they should be persecuted or is so hidden that only traces of the victim are left in the myth. The second type of victim is what I call the victim in travail. That's the victim who finally has a voice. Now, the first time ever in ancient mythology that the victim has a voice is in the Bible. And you have Abel's voice in the garden. You have the voice of so many of the psalmists that are crying out. This voice often will um, cry out for retribution. That's the second type of voice. In both cases, the victim of myth and the victim in travail, innocent but crying out for retribution, both of those continue the cycle of violence. The victim of myth perpetuates the cycle of violence, not from their part, but rather because the community has, has effectively silenced them. The victim of, of travail now plays a role. Um, this isn't fair, God. Come and help me kill my enemies. Both those, again, contribute to the cycle of violence continuing. The third type of victim is the forgiving victim. With the forgiving victim, violence ceases because all retribution ceases. It's the voice of the forgiving victim where we can see God doing God's best work in Scripture. So, for example, if, if I can go to any text, and all I'm asking is whose perspective is this coming from? From the voice of um, religion or from the voice of revelation? And if it's the voice of religion... Which voice am I hearing? Am I hearing the victim of myth, like I would if I read Joshua 7 and the story of Achan? You know, they got Achan to agree at the end, I did it, I did it, you know. Um, that's exactly the same as you find in the Oedipal myths. Mm -hmm. And um, we find in victims of child abuse and domestic abuse. I mean, they, they bought into this. Um, am I dealing with a victim in travail, somebody who's been wounded and is declaring their innocence but wants revenge, like I find in many of the Psalms? Am I dealing with a victim in travail who's not seeking vengeance but is angry at God, like I find in Job? Or do I hear a forgiving victim, like I find in um, Joseph, uh, the servant of Isaiah, 
Many of the Psalms, Psalm 22, the Psalm Jesus utters on the cross to get his persecutors to see that they're scapegoating him, does not end with a cry of vengeance, but with a cry for vindication. Vindicate me, O God. Show them that this was not the right decision. And I think that's the kind of logic that we see being played out in Pauline theology and the doctrine of the resurrection. So it sounds like you're taking, say, the Old Testament and reducing it, to, to put it to a blunt way, reducing it to a series of mythic stories which you can interpret through a tripartite typology, but without any historical correspondence. Would well, that be fair? N- not necessarily. I think one of the interesting projects that Tony Bartlett embarked on is to discover that it's Jehoiachin that is actually the suffering servant figure of Isaiah 53 as a historical figure. Um, I mean, I take the view that most of the Torah was written just before the exile. Moses mm-hmm. had nothing to do with it. Um, that it's put together from uh, different editorial traditions. Uh, I certainly see Isaiah has a school and is broken into three books. I mean, I don't have some theory that says I have to read every verse as though just because God said it, God said it. I derive that hermeneutic from Jesus himself, who in Luke 4, on the Sabbath, quotes a jubilary text in Isaiah 61 and 62 and omits the day of the vengeance of our God saying and gets almost killed for doing that. Um, See, if we have an evangelical, typical evangelical here, though, they're going to be scratching their head. They're going to have a real tough time even making sense of this. That's true. uh, Because it's, there certainly is a paradigm shift here. Are, Are you saying that in terms of the historicity of of events, well, at the at the time you know, at the, at the time of the exile, around 600 BC or thereabouts, that's when texts get drawn together for people people going into exile. But in terms of the historical identity, with whatever they say about God's wrath and so on, we don't understand that as corresponding to any past events. But we simply read that in light of Jesus and what he has brought in the gospel he's brought for how we should live with one another? Well, what I'm trying to say is there may have been a real event like an exodus, Mm -hmm. but how it gets interpreted and then entered into uh, writing is a whole other story. Uh, There may well have been um, a conquest of the land, but how that gets interpreted, it's, it's, I mean, the interpretation is extremely nationalistic in in the historical books. Um, You have the whole issue in Ezra and Nehemiah of whether they are in fact um, telling a false narrative on purpose about the Samaritans. I mean, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that somehow it's a God's perspective. And this is what I think we need to see, is that in both Testaments, both Old and New Testaments, there are these two categories of religion or revelation. And, And while there's a lot of religion in the Old Testament and some revelation breaking through all over the place, and while the New Testament is mostly revelation, we can still see religion creeping back in, uh, and particularly in the Jerusalem church, the James Peter church, who I think are the uh, uber apostles of Second Corinthians and the real troublemakers behind Galatia and Rome. So what does inspiration mean then? Uh, if, what does it mean for Scripture to be God-breathed or to, to call it Scripture, to call it God's Word? Well, you know, well, first of all, I don't call Scripture God's Word. I, I think that's a misnomer. Jesus is God's Word. Uh, Jesus is the only one called the Logos. And it means more than Word, as you know. It has many meanings. <clears throat> the um, question about the inspiration of Scripture, I, can, I mean, people will think of 2 Timothy 3.16. Well, all Scripture is inspired by God. And I want to, okay, just a second now. That's 2 Timothy 3.16. What's it say in verse 13, 14, and 15 about two of Moses' opponents, Janus and Jambres? Now go in your Bible and find those names. They're not there. They're not in the Hebrew text. They're not in the Septuagint. But they are in the Targums, the Aramaic paraphrases that were used in the synagogues. Well, golly gee, is the writer saying that Targums are inspired? Because if that's the case then Cain is a a Sadducee and Abel is a Pharisee, according to the Genesis Targum. So what's he saying? What's he referring to? I mean, that's an issue you've got to deal with because even though he quotes the Septuagint, he's just referenced a Targum. It's part of his tradition. Are you saying that text gets proof-texted sometimes? Yeah, I think. Uh 
Second, there's the question, does it need to be translated all scripture? The RSV offers it as an alternative. Every scripture that is inspired by God. Well, when you look at the Greek, it's just pasagraphe the apnustos. Had the author wanted to say the whole of scripture, the entirety of scripture, he would have said, hey, passe, the apnustos. So you have to ask, is this what the writer's really saying? When we make a theory of canon out of 2 Timothy 3.16. Well, there, there are several theories of atonement at play. So if, if you could say a little bit more about what Jesus did and how it's unique, uh, assuming that it's unique. What's unique about the Jesus story is that it's told from the perspective of the forgiving victim and published. It's the first publication we have of a vi- forgiving victim who speaks. Um, it's that publication that has created all the change in um, human culture since that time and that allows us here at the beginning of the 21st century to recognize victims don't work anymore. I mean, we've learned that lesson big from the Holocaust forward. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to jump right in there. So okay. uh, you said that it's unique because this is the first published case of the, the f- f- uh, victim offering forgiveness. So that may just be a historical accident, then. Is there anything unique about Christ beyond that, or is it simply that he just happened to be the first one to have this recorded extension of forgiveness? Think about this. What's the burden of Jesus' ministry? Almost everybody's going to say the reign of God, the, the, you know, the basileia the'u. Um, but is it not the case that if you look at the Gospels the way the old critic, form critics did, Forgiveness is the one thing that appears in every type or every form of genre in the synoptics, from conflict stories to miracle stories, apothegmata, parables, teaching on prayer. I mean, forgiveness permeates the Jesus tradition. In fact, there's only one place we ask God to imitate us, and that's in the petition on forgiveness. That's the only place we ask God to imitate us. So forgiveness suffuses the the Jesus story, the Jesus narrative. That's what the cross is about. As long as we tie that forgiveness to a deal, to a transaction, what we do is we completely depersonalize it. We turn God into another alcoholic in the sky, just like all the Janus-faced gods of human culture. God is no different than the other gods. And there's no good news here, because it essentially says, you have to believe this or you will burn in hell. I mean, that is propagandistic torture. And for me, there's nothing good about it. This is, in many ways, I mean, what you're saying is certainly radical. And and radical with respect to what Christians have typically said in the past. Now, this raises all sorts of questions, and I guess... One question is, if you're right about a lot of your reading, how did the church get it wrong for so long? The Jesus-driven life, um, the first three chapters are on Jesus. The fourth chapter is on the early church in Constantine, uh, the, the Augustinian Constantinian shift. There's several major players that begin to make uh, navigational errors theologically that have taken the church off track right from the get-go, but we shouldn't be surprised. Because no matter how off-track the church gets, the one thing you see occurring over and over and over again in church history so many hundreds and thousands of times is the gospel breaking free. We only know the big ones, like Luther at the Reformation or Wesley, you know. There are many, many, many thousands of examples of the gospel breaking free of the sacrificial logic that it became due to a... Justin Martyr, combining the logos of Greek philosophy, and in Greek philosophy, logos equals polemos, or violence, and Heraclitus forward, with the nonviolent logos of the New Testament. By combining the two, logos Christology now can become the story of the descent of the violent God. That's the first big mistake. It just absolutely screws things. Second is Eusebius, and the way he will tell the story of the early church. Eusebius is a pacifist in the first edition of the church history. Um, But after Constantine's um, great defeat at the Milvian Bridge, Eusebius becomes a a great supporter of Constantine. I'm sorry, his victory. becomes a great supporter of Constantine. And from that point on, 
will tell Constantine's story and omit all of the murders that Constantine committed, including that of his own son Crispus. Mm. And we'll proceed to say... Well, he's the 13th apostle, after all. Mm -hmm. And then you've got um, Augustine, who, because of his Manichaean, uh, Neoplatonic background and his dependence upon Platonian anthropology, lays a dualistic framework for the West from, you know, 400 forward. And we've lived with that heritage ever since. And those answers that, you know, were, were given by Augustine, and he was a great theologian. He was incredible. Otherwise, he would not have had this long of a lasting influence. But it is now time to think critically back through the entire tradition, not lay the blame anywhere, and simply say where our forefathers and mothers have come and gone, and we can see where they were growing. We don't have to repeat their mistakes. We can be grateful for where they were at that time in history and on their journey. They were doing the best they could with what they knew. Our children will take our theology and make it better, and my grandchildren, I hope, make their parents even better. So... I have a way of looking at history, kind of in bonum partum, you know, that it, it, it really is, uh, church history is, for all of its horrors and terrors, still quite a beautiful thing. So what is the gospel in the middle of this? I'll tell you one thing about penal substitution. It's easy to sing. It, it makes for a capsule summary gospel that you can quickly share sure. with somebody. Sure. What is the gospel for you? <laughs> the gospel is that God loves you. God, well, that's even simpler. God is deeply in love with you. In fact, God treasures you, treasures your life. Um, you are God's child. Whether you know it or not, whether you care or not, um, God still cares for you. And you know how it is with little kids, and sometimes they're mad at mommy and daddy, but we still love them. Well, it's the same with God. And and um, I want you to know that there's nothing you can do to earn God's love. God just loves you. And um, when you'd like to hear more, I'd be happy to share, but in the meantime, I want you to know you're all good with God. Okay, you're all good. So there's no repentance required? What's repentance? I, uh, confession of sin, a turning from one's <clears throat> sinful ways. Isn't that funny? That's exactly the definition of sin Luther rebelled against, or the definition of, of that that Luther rebelled against. No. It's repentance uh, means to change your mind. In Hebrew, shuv simply means to turn around. God, God is just a, your spurned lover. Turn around. He longs to hold you in his arms again. I mean, repentance, change your way of thinking. If you think that God is angry at you, change your way of thinking. If you think that God is somehow waiting to catch you doing something wrong, forget about it. God already knows you. There's nothing that's going to surprise him about you. You can't surprise God. Now, there are some texts that we probably should touch upon, and, and they relate to posthumous judgment, judgment in the afterlife. So, so how do we understand texts that are understood to be texts of God's eternal punishment or hell, or weeping and gnashing of teeth, a, a lake of fire, a fiery furnace, and so on? Let me break this apart into several pieces. First, um, I believe there is a judgment I do believe there will come a time when we stand before the living God and are shown ourselves for ourselves. The things that we can't see are shadow side, as Jung would put it. Um, I also believe at that time there's extre- extreme and extraordinary mercy shown and compassion. And um, there will be weeping. I know I'll weep. There's things I've done in my life that I just wish I had never done, wish they weren't part of my story, but they are. Um, Okay, now, now the weeping is perhaps repentance or sorrow and feeling bad for what you've done. A gnashing of teeth would seem to suggest rebellion. I mean, it, it certainly the, the people who are about to stone Stephen gnashed their teeth at him. So it seems to, to show sort of rage and rebellion. So isn't, isn't that indicative of a continued unrepentant spirit? Um, I don't think that Jesus um, taught that. Um, the only gospel you're going to find this language in is Matthew. You don't find it Mark, Luke, or John. This is Matthean language. Um, I think I could give you a good ten reasons why I think the Matthean author, given his social environment out of which he's writing, the issues that he's dealing with, uh, turns around and buys back into the apocalyptic myth of First Enoch and, and um, uh, just apocalyptic Judaism. Um, I think the Matthean writer is split 
of, he's of two minds, he, but he can't go all the way that Paul goes or John goes or Luke goes or the writer of the Hebrews goes. He can't quite go that far. And he puts sayings on the mouth of Jesus that relate to this. So <clears throat> that's my first response. Second is that when you get to the book of Revelation, as you know, that's the one book that has suffered most in canonical history. It took 10 centuries for the church to finally even begin to agree on it. The East never uses it in its liturgy. It's not read. Mm -hmm. Luther threw it out, Zwingli threw it out, Calvin writes commentaries on every book but the Revelation. I mean, how can it become the centerpiece of modern fundamentalist or conservative evangelical thought? I don't know. How can a book that has so many questions about it that's so hard to interpret that you, you can't even begin to make sense out of the imagery and the, and the metaphors? I mean, by God, that's an acid trip gone, you know, on God or something, you know? How could that book become the centerpiece of our thinking. I don't think it can. I think we need to put it out to the margins, develop the gospel from the gospels, from Paul, and then from Hebrews. Um, and then you can bring in revelation. Then you can begin to say, okay, what's the revelator seeing and not seeing? Well, he's seeing certain things. He's seeing that it's a lamb that triumphs, not a lion. The lion's a lamb. The, he sees that the the martyr on the white horse already is dipped in blood. There's no battle yet, but there's blood. All, there's blood there. He hears the voice of the martyrs crying out. I mean, you have all of this language, but you still have that at the end, uh, and the only time in the New Testament that you have anything like this, that kind of dis Dante's description, stolen from apocalyptic Judaism, right out of Enoch. So. Eh, I don't know. Is it God's word? Eh, not for me. Can it be interpreted? Um, yes, it can. Can it be valuable? Yes, it is. Um, do I buy it as some description of reality eschatologically? Absolutely not. So are you saying that, that you're open to revising your understanding of canon? or is, do you, Are you skeptical of the idea of canon itself? Or? I'm not skeptical of it. If I'm in a Protestant church, I have 66 books I can use. If I'm in a Catholic church, I have 80. If I'm in Ethiopia, I have First Enoch. Depends on the church, you know. Um, I can use any canon that's. You, if I'm going to end up ever preaching in a synagogue, I have a canon. I know what I'm allowed to use. Um, okay, now you also have a canon in a Mormon tabernacle. Would you be comfortable with that canon? No, no, no. Okay, no, that's not Christian. That's hyper-fundamentalist, weird sectarianism. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. it just, it's not Christian. I wish they'd stop claiming themselves as Christian for crying out loud. If you can't go near the Nicene Creed, don't call yourself a Christian. Mm. So the Nicene Creed is, is, would be an example of uh, something pivotal to identify Christians as? Me, for me, yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. I think uh, you have to... That, the, the Nicene Creed, the, that is the Trinitarian formula, was the regula fide, the rule of faith in the early church. I mean, it was that which is taught at baptism. I mean, we have Trinitarian formula at baptism. And, and because this, it's this Trinitarian understanding of God that Jesus changes the equation of God. That, that when you include Jesus in a doctrine of God, your doctrine of God changes. And that's why Trinity becomes so important. I think it's this rule. There is a paradigm shift that occurs when you include Jesus in your theology. So that rule of faith trumps for me every other claim out there that you would identify what a Christian is or isn't. I mean, I'm not talking about people that simply acknowledge it intellectually, and there are some of those, but those that have really begun to work this out in their thinking. Now, I'm going to, I want to turn to ethics in just a moment. I don't do ethics. I'm yeah. a bad man. <laughs> right. You can talk about it at least. You don't have to do it. You can talk about it. But first, uh, I'm trying to peg you. You know, I like to put people into categories. Okay, there's the liberal and there's the evangelical. And say things that sound sort of very evangelical. And I don't, I don't necessarily mean that in a North American sense of evangelical, but certainly gospel-centered. Other times you sound very liberal in, in your approach to, to scripture or inspiration or historicity or something. So what do you feel about categories like that, and where do you put yourself? I have had so many people tell me they can't peg me, hmm. and that's because I don't think I can be pegged. Um, I drink from a lot of wells. Um, when I was in seminary, this 
recent um, transfer uh, to the seminary I was attending, he'd come from Dallas Theological. And after a year of conversations with him, just before we graduated, Dave came up to me and said, you know, Michael, I figured out your problem. I said, well, okay, what is it? He says, you're not conservative and you're not liberal. You're orthodox. Hmm. I said, well, maybe it's growing up Catholic. I don't know, you know, and uh, maybe it's my love of of the church in spite Hmm. of herself. Um, I'm okay with that. Uh, In fact, some parts of my theology are very evangelical. I self-identify as an evangelical. I have good news. I preach good news. I'm delighted to be a preacher of good news. I'm an evangelical. Um, I have uh, affinities, uh, and I learned a lot from Dr. King and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and so I I have a view of of social ethics. I continue to learn from Richard Rohr and Thomas Merton and and the mystic writers of the Middle Ages in the early monastic communities, so there's a spiritual component that doesn't fit in often with the historical critical, rhetorical critical, uh, all that other critical stuff that I end up using. Mm -hmm. None of this fits with the scientific work that I do. It doesn't matter to me. I, I just, I am who I am and I'm happy. And I, evidently I'm seeing something because people are writing me all the time about how it's changed their life. Mm. So I don't know. Well, and we certainly need more voices that stand outside of nicely set categories. It makes the conversation a lot more interesting. I just got compared to Tom Wright today on Facebook. I thought that was an honor. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is way cool. <laughs> it's like when I was in Australia, I got called the dude twice. Oh, yeah. Once at a high mass, I got introduced as the dude of theology. <laughs> you know, all I need is a joint or something. <laughs> If you can be cool and be an academic, you got it all. So I don't know. Yeah, right. Okay, so so ethics-wise, then, I mean, I'm I'm chomping at the bit to hear a little bit more about how your conception of the gospel feeds into ethics and how that contrasts with some of these more traditional views, such as the Calvinistic view of penal satisfaction. I take it that you see those as having very different implications for ethics than your view. Sure, the the penal satisfaction is going to lead to the Third use of the law, it's inevitable. Um, Luther had two uses for the law. One is that it turns you to Christ, and, and I'm sorry, one is that it showed you how bad you were, and the other is that it turns you to Jesus. Calvin brings the third use of the law, and that is that the law can be now used as a guide for the Christian life and civil society. He would have loved to have seen the two as one. The way I do... Um, gospel is that ethics are the natural outworking of the healing of human relationships. So I have a, uh, an important psychological component in my understanding of atonement theory that completely feeds into ethics that is missing in um, penal substitution. For me, um, we are not autonomous individuals. This, again, is a, a Girardian category. Um, the autonomous individual is a, a myth of the Enlightenment. Um, psychology has made the shift from um, uh, this business of what they call faculty psychology, parts, mind, will, you mm-hmm. know, these things, to relationality. Philosophy's made the shift to relationality. It's time. I mean, even uh, Zizioulis has made that shift in his Trinitarian book, you know, God and Communion. Mm -hmm. Moltmann makes that shift in his thinking. It's time for us to recognize that the notion of the autonomous human no longer exists. We are our relationships. So there's Randall here and there's Michael here. But what the real the real thing is not this Michael or this Randall, but this relationship that exists between Michael and and that's what gets healed in the gospel. That's Paul's argument or the writer's argument in Ephesians two. It's Paul's argument all through Romans. It's our relationships that are healed. It's re- our relationship with God that gets healed by Jesus' announcement of forgiveness at the cross. So for me, sin. The best definition I ever heard of sin was sin is the destructive way we handle our pain. Sin now is not some thing I do against an abstract category of a great big book for, of 900 pages like the IRS tax code that God's got in heaven, and I don't know if this is wrong, and I don't know if that's wrong or right or what, you know, and I'm trying to figure all this out. No. Sin, I can recognize real simple. When I say the unkind word, when I say the snide remark, when I um, hate someone in my heart, when my people piss me off and I flip them the bird, I recognize sin. 
And it's all about my relationships. And when my relationships are whole, when Jesus is working in those, all of my relationships to heal them, that's gospel. There's, and you don't hurt somebody in gospel but because the only command is that of love. And that's what you're really doing. And when you don't do it, you ask forgiveness. And when others don't do it to you, you forgive. And you continue to model this in all your relationships. For me, that's the point of discipleship. Discipleship is not obedience to rules and regulations. It is about learning how to relate to people the way Jesus relates to people. How does this apply? I mean, I, I can't help but go into sort of these issues of church, state, politics, and so on. But how does this apply at the level of the Christian person in the military, let's say? Uh, do Christians belong in the military? Do they belong on police services? I say I would say no. Um, I'm not sure how you could ever follow Jesus and carry a weapon that could kill someone. I mean, I think at that point, you've already made a decision. You've already decided that it's okay with God. You've already said, in my paradigm, God gets to do it in the Old Testament, and so we get to do it as agents of God. And God said that the state functions as this thing that you know holds society in check, and you have to honor the emperor and all that. It's in the Bible, so I'm okay. But what they've never thought through is that Jesus' radical commands are for his followers. And they've managed to so excuse themselves from that that they really can't see. So, But I don't blame men and women who grow up in churches entering service or police service. Um, they mean well. Um, one could argue we couldn't do without them. And it's probably the case. It's kind of that catacomb effect of the mm-hmm. Second Thessalonians. However, I think if we take Jesus seriously, we find that um, he is not about the destruction of the enemy other, that there is no enemy other, that the moment we create an enemy other, whether it's the criminal in the street or the Muslim across the planet, the moment we do that, we've stepped out of discipleship into the deceit of um, sacred violence. Tell us about your, your website and ministry. Preaching Peace, uh, it's preachingpeace.org is the website. It was created in 2002. Um, uh, I did, at that time, uh, an anthropological reading, a reading from a Girardian peace perspective of the Gospels and did the lectionary cycle. And then it's grown over the years. It's, um, we've, uh, the, the website has articles, podcasts, videos. Um, I've published four books uh, in the last few years. The most recent is The Jesus Driven Life. That's the big one. In fact, mm. this is the revised second edition. It just arrived today, mm. and it goes on sale uh, next Monday, October 7th, on Amazon. Okay, we'll link to it. Yeah. Um, we've done conferences, uh, like I said, seminars. Um, we, I do a lot of teaching. Yeah, and so I go around working all kinds of ways to spread the good news. And yes, it is a challenge to the standard evangelical paradigm, and that's okay. That's okay. God wants evangelicals to repent too. God's also going to save Christians, you're saying? Yes, yes, God is going to save Christians. Michael, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you, Randall.